Good afternoon, everybody. I thought I would just show you a picture of my university in Umeå in the north of Sweden, because usually when you have a meeting in Aberdeen, you have speakers from the south. So well, on this occasion, you have speaker from the north. Uh, you need to go another 500 miles north from here to get up to, uh, uh, to the latitude of Umeå, so it's almost in the Arctic Circle. And as you see, um, we pride ourselves on having pictures of the university with the northern lights in the, in the, in the, in the background. I'm not Swedish, as you also probably gathered from, uh, from my voice. So uh, I, I am British and actually, although Umeå is my sort of academic home, I work a lot from uh, my actual home, which is, which is near London. So Lucia asked me to to talk about measuring global burden of disease and, and then to go from that into some of the specific specifics of, of verbal autopsy, which is what I will try and do. So global burden of disease to begin with, and I'm, I'm, this is not capital G, capital B, capital D global burden of disease. This is, you know, what uh, questions of what is or, or are the burdens of various diseases on a, on a global basis. And I'm professor of global health, so you know, that's, that's quite, an, quite a fundamental question if you do the kind of things I do to, uh, to try and quantify the, the burden of disease. And the World Health Organization, of course, also has that as a, uh, uh, as a very uh, high priority agenda within what they do, and uh, I work quite closely with them as well. So just to give us a kind of entree into the whole issue of global burden of disease, fairly randomly chosen this slide, which comes from World Health Organization, of maternal mortality on a global basis. And it's an interesting example because, as you can see from the legend here, maternal mortality, in other words, deaths related to pregnancy, are one of the things that vary hugely across the world. So you have some countries that are in the range of under 20 per 100,000 um, pregnancies per, uh, uh, where, where mothers die, uh, right up to other countries where there's more than 1,000 maternal deaths per 100,000 pregnancies. So that's, that's greater than a 1% chance of maternal death related to, to, to pregnancy. Now, I'm not particularly trying to talk about uh, maternal death as a subject here this afternoon, although I know Ab Aberdeen has a strong track record in that, uh, with Wendy Graham and uh, Sahini and other people who uh, worked a lot in that sort of area. But it is one of the difficult and important global burdens that we need to be able to, me to measure. And you don't have to be a genius when you look at this map to see that most of the dark coloration is in Africa, and particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. And that also, or at least the same chart, could, also, could almost be a map of where we don't have data. You know, the dark, you, could, you could almost have an alternative legend for this map and have the, the darker colours where we don't have data rather than uh, where maternity is, 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 is dangerous. And so that's a kind of interaction between what you're measuring and how you can measure it or the availability of, of, of information to measure it. And, and that commonly occurs in this, in this whole area. And that causes a huge amount of, of problems because where you really want to have, where you really want to know what you're talking about, you haven't got the data. Where you're not desperately worried about maternal mortality as a public health problem, like Norway, for example, the uh, maternal mortality ratio is two, and that that equates to about one or two maternal deaths per year in the whole country. So, you know, of course you don't want anybody to die, but, uh, you know, that is not Norway's number one priority. So we know lots of, uh, the, I mean, the Norwegian public health people can tell you exactly, you know, Mrs. So-and-so died, I mean, she was the maternal death for, the, for, the, for this year kind of thing. Uh, 
Um, so the data is not a problem, but also the, the problem is not the problem, if you see what I mean. So it's, uh, that, that's, that's, where we're, uh, that's where we're at. So when we talk about global burden of disease, there's a huge amount of estimation goes on. And, and the, the way in which these different African countries have been colored in in various shades of, of purple on the, on the slide actually don't reflect a lot of actual deaths being recorded and counted and documented. They reflect a lot of complicated analysis that's gone, out, gone on in national ministries of health and in WHO uh, statistics department in, in, in Geneva and so on, making the best estimates. And so that difference between what is estimated and what is measured is actually profoundly important. And we need to do both. We have to do both, actually, to understand what's going on in the world. But the two are not the same. And you have to be very clear as to what is really individually documented cases and what is a constructed kind of estimate uh, based around such evidence as may be available. Now, if you... Um, read about the, the global burden of disease. Uh, I deliberately said at the beginning, it, uh, I was talking about global burden of disease, small GBD. Um, there's also a big GBD, which started off in the WHO um, 20 years ago, um, or a bit more than 20 years ago now, and uh, has continued and does continue. And a lot of the work for that now is, is located at the uh, IHME in, in Seattle, um, in, in Washington state. And it was interesting when, when, when this sort of stream of work of, and this is GBD, capital GBD, is basically an es a series of estimating methods for uh, deriving what are the conditions around the world rather than it's not about a lot of people running around documenting individual cases of everything and um, I was asked to write a, a commentary um, when, on the 20th anniversary of GBD in 2017 and this is the a figure from that and it's quite interesting because what we see actually uh, so I, I've, I've looked at GBD estimates that were made in 1997 for 1990 and 2015. So that was looking back a bit and looking forward quite a long way. That's the, that's the shades of blue, okay? And then the GBD estimates that were made in 2015 for 2015 and looking back to 1990. So the, the time scale of both of these is the same, but one is the set of estimates that were made looking forwards, and one is the set of estimates that were made with the benefit of hindsight, the, the, the red ones. And there are some very interesting differences. And this is not all causes of death at all. It's just some that I deliberately chose to, to, to show in this, in this diagram. First, first of all, if you look, if you look at measles, so. The, in, the, in the 1997 version of the estimates, it was estimate, they estimated that measles was quite high-ish in 1990, and it would have fallen quite a lot by 2015. In fact, with the benefit of hindsight, the red equivalent of the, of the estimates, it was indeed quite high mortality from measles in 1990, but the measles vaccination campaigns that were widely implemented around the world were much more successful than the estimates had predicted. So it was only when they actually came to looking at it retrospectively, they realized that actually measles had diminished massively to almost, almost nothing, um, even though that wasn't what GBD predicted. So these, and these are interesting things to contemplate when you're actually looking at a set of estimates that are made at a particular point in time, because you, you have to reflect on you know, what is known at the point when the estimates were made about the future and the, and the past. And every time a new set of estimates is made, to some extent, that rewrites history. I mean, they, they, you know, they re-estimate for all the previous years. So these estimates are not quite as simple as 
they sometimes seem. Tetanus is a very similar story to measles and for the same reason. So tetanus, another vaccine preventable disease where the vaccination campaigns were more successful in reality than was predicted before, before they started. So tetanus and measles following a very similar pattern. If you look at the big one, ischemic heart disease, which is one of the leading causes of death all around the world, you can see that um, the, in 1997, the prediction was that it would become bigger, a bit bigger, which it did. And, and, that, and the fact that it did is reflected in the, in the red lines. So, but you can see very little difference between the blue version and the, and the red version here. Now, partly, of course, because that's a very common cause of death, more is known about it. So the estimates work better. There's less uncertainty, less, um, less range, less, less, less unpredictability about it. And nobody's about to produce a vaccine that prevents um, ischemic heart disease. So, you know, there isn't any kind of major intervention that's going to just uh, take it right down to something very low like the measles story. Um, HIV AIDS, an interesting story, of course, was recognised to be increasing rapidly when it was estimated in 97, and indeed it did increase rapidly with the benefit of, of hindsight. So that, that, that worked, worked reasonably well. And so you can, can go on, but the point of the slide is really that estimates are not neutral, you know, um, fixed concepts. It depends when the estimates were made and the period for which the estimates were supposed to be covering. You have to think about both of those things actually to understand the validity of, of any particular estimate. And sometimes, or very often actually, these estimates are used as though they are facts. And they're, they're not facts in the conventional statistical sense. They are estimates. And one of the slight arguments I have with the GBD group in, in Seattle is they often they run these very sophisticated and very clever models and produce lots of very interesting figures from them. But they, rather than calling them estimates, they often talk about GBD results. And I, I I'm uncomfortable with that because they're not actually results in the conventional epidemiological sense of results. They're very valuable, but they are, they are something else. They are, they, they are estimates. One of the very useful ways of considering any kind of uh, measurement where estimation is involved is to, is to do a co-validation exercise. And this is, this is one particular co-validation exercise in relation to um, cause of death. And this uses the GBD from um, IHME in terms of cause of death for a number of African countries. And it also uses direct verbal autopsy data on individual cases that were documented in those same countries at the same time. I'm, I'm coming to talk a bit more about what verbal autopsy is, so don't just uh, kind of don't worry about that for the moment. Uh, that, that's the next slide or two. But what, what is important here is the concept of, you know, if you're not quite sure about something, so we have some questions about the estimation process. We have some doubts about the verbal autopsy process as a, as a concept, which we'll, we'll come on to discuss. But the process of co or the approach of co-validation is actually very useful. And so all we're saying here is that this black line, which is, is not the, that's not a correlation line, it's a, it's a line of equivalence. So, you know, it goes, so one is one and 10 is 10 and 100 is 100 and so on. So, in a, perfect, in a perfectly organized world, all of the spots would be on the line. And clearly they're not quite, but also they're not a million miles off the line. You can calculate a, 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 a concordance correlation coefficient, it's called a special type of correlation coefficient if you want to, if you want to, uh, if you want to measure that. But what's important is the, is the principle that you do two completely different processes starting from absolutely different material, independent methods, independent sources, and you, both of those processes are trying to get at the same thing. So in this case, 
the, uh, the proportion of causes of death from, from different causes. And if they are quite well correlated, and these are, generally speaking, quite well correlated, it doesn't mean that either method A or method B is correct in absolute terms, but these are two hugely complicated methods on massive data sets, and the fact that they come out correlated by chance is microscopically small. I mean, you, you know, you, 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 it's not credible that they would come out highly correlated just by chance when you're doing things in a totally different way. So it doesn't, it doesn't give you any sense of which is better or which is worse, just that they're highly similar and that, that actually gives credibility to, to both methods. And that, that's quite a useful approach, I think, when you're dealing with highly uncertain um, data. So the idea of verbal autopsy, I will, should explain in a bit more detail. What it really means is that in places where deaths are not certified and where death certificates with cause of death are not issued, and some of you will be familiar with the concept that not all countries register deaths effectively. Others of you may assume that if you come from a country where deaths are all registered effectively, that every country does that. It's, it's not, not the case. And WHO estimates that out of about 60 million deaths per year, which is about the going rate for all deaths in, you know, over the, uh, worldwide per year, about 30 million, so about half of those are certified with a cause and about half of them are not certified with a, with, with a cause. But of course, a bit like the maternal mortality diagram that I showed you, an awful lot of the, uh, an awful lot of the ones that are not certified are in Africa, Asia, um, low middle income countries, certainly, because of course, a lot of higher income countries, it's a legal responsibility to have a death certificate. You can't bury a body until you've got a legal death certificate, etc. So there are procedures in place to stop that. In places where it's not obligatory to, um, to get a death certificate, verbal autopsy is an alternative strategy which is quite widely used and increasingly widely used, where after a death, uh, an interviewer goes to uh, the home of where the death occurred and carries out a structured interview according to a WHO specification with somebody who was familiar with the circumstances of the death. And the, the WHO questionnaire is quite long, but it's not, it's not that complicated. They're, they're basically simple yes, no questions. It's things like, you know, did she have a fever? Was he vomiting? And things like age and sex and all the, all the rest of it. So there's a whole load of questions that are gathered. And from that, a cause of death can be derived. And this diagram shows the possibilities that you can, ha you can find a household at which there is a death and there's various permutations and combinations around these uh, circles. But basically, the idea is that a death is somehow identified. Somebody does the data collection using probably a tablet because that's the easiest way of, of, of handling the, the skip patterns in, these, in this questionnaire. And you um, and you then process that to give the the cause of the cause of death. And so a lot of what I'm now going to talk about is the means by which you can process that information to get a cause of death. I'm not going to say much more about the actual business of doing the interview. I'm more interested in how do you get the cause of death having having done the interview. So. There's quite a long story to, to this whole um, business of getting cause of death from a VA interview. Um, we're now on version five of a mathematical model that does that, that we, we developed in UMU. Um, and the five is not necessarily the all singing, all dancing one, but we're, we're on five for the, for, the, for, the, for the time being. Six may come. Um, Five was um, released in 2018, and there's a BMC medical article about it uh, published in 2019. 
this just goes to show some of the complexity that's involved. So there's a development phase of, of, of the model, which is, is, is this part, and then there has to be some kind of testing phase as well. And this is all quite complex and, and quite difficult to do because, of course, you're, you're working a bit blindfolded in the sense that you're doing this in the first place because you don't know a lot about the cause of death in the, in the places where you're doing it. And so you have to, uh, validating it is not, is not an easy process. There's not really any gold standard that you can, that you can use. And to be, to be honest, um, with apologies to those of you who are, who are medics, you know, physician death certificates are not um, definitely correct, <laughs> every one of them. I'm not saying they're all wrong, but <laughs> there is a, quite a big uncertainty. So it's not just a question of saying, oh, let's do this where we've got certified causes of death, because um, that's, that's also not a gold standard. It's, uh, it, it's, not, it's not irrelevant, but it's, it doesn't give you a certain outcome. And actually, to be honest, the, the methodology for verbal autopsy has been more rigorously evaluated, I would say, now than the physician uh, writing of, of, of death certificates. So it's, a, it's an interesting scenario. So we're, we're the, the method that is supposedly <coughs> less certain has actually been more strongly uh, investigated in terms of validity than the method that a lot of people assume is the right one. It's interesting. There are a lot of these kind of comparisons that go on, and I'm not going to speak about this in great detail, but it's the same kind of diagram in principle as we had before. So this is, this is part of that same evaluation of the latest um, InterVA5 model in comparison with the InterVA4 model, because, of course, on the one hand, we need to make improvements when we revise the model, but we also have to be sure that we're not doing something that's you know totally incompatible with what's with what's gone before it's like any kind of software upgrade really i mean you know when you when microsoft issues a new windows or apple issues a new ios or something you 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 hope that there are good new things in that new release but you also hope that the the things that are already established are not spoiled by the by by the changes that you've made so this is part of that. And this same paper that I was talking about in BMC Medicine has a lot of nerdy comparisons like this between different versions of different models and so on, justifying that actually the new model is, performs better, but also is, compat is backwards compatible with, with, with what's gone before. So let's look at a slightly more practical example, because just talking about models in general isn't, isn't terribly fascinating. Um, though I do spend a lot of my time thinking about that. But um, we, we can look at a particular example of an uh, application of verbal autopsy, which is, is quite interesting. So this is a map of the northeastern part of South Africa. So that's the, that's the border between South Africa and Mozambique up there. And this is the Indian Ocean here. So here is part of Mozambique, and this is South Africa. So Johannesburg is way off to the, to the, to the left. It's quite a, a detailed map. And the colouring on this map comes from a series of estimates from um, the Malaria Atlas project, which is based at University of Oxford. And they have maps for the whole world of what they think the malaria parasite load is in, uh, in, in detail. And that's what these colours represent. Now, one of the places that um, we've done quite a lot of the development work of these verbal autopsy models is the Agincourt uh, Health and Demographic uh, Surveillance Site, which is just here inside that rectangle, just inside South Africa. And you can see very close to the edge of no transmission. So th this brown area here is, is malaria-free. So we're, we're talking about an area that's just marginal malaria transmission, but not high risk and I mean I, I've I've spent you know a long time in that area and not really worried about getting malaria M Maria lives there and doesn't worry a lot about getting malaria now so uh, it, it's um, it, it's very low transmission it's actually kind of off the radar really as far as serious a lot of serious malariologists would go and you can see uh, 
Mozambique, the, this orangey stuff uh, around towards Maputo and along the Mozambican coast and so on, different order of magnitude of transmission. So uh, the, the, that, that would be where, if you wanted to study malaria, it would be much more interesting to go here because there'd be a lot more cases. But we're going to look at what happens when you look at malaria deaths in this, er in this very marginal transmission area, just right on, the, right on the edge of things there. And we had verbal autopsy data for 20 years, 21 years, I think it was actually, altogether. And it's quite seasonal um, in terms of when malaria deaths occur. So the, the bouncy lines are malaria deaths by month. You can see there's all sorts of peaks. And that, that's what you expect, actually, in a low transmission area because there's not enough transmission for people to have very much immunity and so people are quite susceptible when the when the conditions are right for for transmission but the so the solid line is the yearly aggregate of this of this monthly line and it's actually quite worrying because if you look at this you can see in the early 90s and we've got data from Agincourt going verbal autopsy data for all the deaths going back to 1992 and this is where you begin to see the power of actually having that case-by-case case detailed information. Um, there was very little malaria mortality. So this is around the time when uh, South Africa uh, moved into its new democratic era. And about 0 0.02 deaths per thousand. And you can see that, okay, it goes up and down a bit, but actually 20 years later, it's Ten times higher than it than it than it was at the beginning. Now that's not actually a terribly politically acceptable um, finding, and it was quite amusing because about about a, a couple of weeks after we published this, um, Jacob Zuma, who was at that point the president of South Africa, was presented with a special award at the African Union, who at that time was headed by his former wife, <laughs> Amini Zuma with a special trophy for malaria reduction. <laughs> he obviously hadn't read the paper. Oh, somebody hadn't read the paper. <laughs> but, you know, a tenfold increase in malaria mortality over 20 years is actually quite major. We did quite a lot of analyses in, in, this, in this paper that, that describes why, and part of that is about weather and uh, changes in uh, long-term patterns of weather, which in climate. Partly also about people moving around. There was, a, there was a point in here somewhere, I think about here, where South Africans no longer needed visas to go to M Mozambique. You remember the colour of Mozambique compared with the colour of South Africa? So, and, and actually a lot of people who live in that area of South Africa have cousins and families and so on living in Mozambique, so there's a lot of you know, re social reason to, 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 to travel. So that was probably a driver as well. And actually, when we looked in a bit more detail, we could, so we, what we did was to analyse the whole thing in terms of individual months and to look at quartiles of temperature. So there were, um, so mean monthly uh, mean daily temperature average over 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 the month um, in the, in those in those ranges and rainfall averaged over the month similarly in those ranges and these numbers in the coloured squares are the malaria mortality rates and shows extremely clearly that the combination of wet and warm months. And the, these are actually, this is actually the weather in the month before the deaths because the, the weather impacts on mosquito breeding and you need more mosquitoes that breed faster when it's wet and, and warm and so then they have a chance to bite somebody and become infective to somebody else. So that whole process takes about a, a month. So it's no good trying to match the weather in the month with the mortality in that same month. You have to be looking at the, the, the weather in the previous month against the, the mortality. And you, you, can, you can see that that's very nicely correlated. Now, in one sense, that doesn't 
say anything very much about malaria because it's long been established that you know malaria risk increases when it's wet and and warm and and, and humid and we know that from the uh, from from all around the world but what's interesting of course is that this is a another kind of if you like another kind of co-validation really because we've just picked out all of the malaria deaths irrespective of the seasons that they occurred in and and also the important thing was that nobody was looking specifically for malaria deaths so we're, this is an analysis of you know 130 malaria deaths that occurred out of 16,000 deaths or something like that in the, from all causes in the in the population and there is a danger if you go you know if you are the malaria specialist or you are the uh, liver specialist or you are the anything specialist if you go looking for deaths that belong to your specialism you can get perverse kind of things you know if you if you want malaria deaths you look for everybody that's febrile and and and, and, and so on so there wasn't any question of that happening in these we just picked them out retrospectively and matched them retrospectively against the weather and the weather data is very easy to well re relatively easy to do that with now because there are there are gridded global models of weather that apply to every um, two kilometer square of the world for every hour of every day of every month going back for several decades so you can literally say you know we're, we're dealing with uh, that little area of the world on the uh, 25th of August 1995 what was the temperature what was the rainfall and so on so even though we never did any weather measurement, we could retrospectively download all of that and match it against, um, against the malaria death. So it's another kind of way of, get, of getting into to, to, to validity. And clearly, if the, if the verbal autopsy system and the model that we're using for verbal autopsy was not correctly identifying malaria deaths, if it was uh, calling something malaria deaths that were not malaria deaths, you would not expect to see this uh, this relationship with with with, with temperature and, uh, and 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 rainfall that, that, that clearly comes out. So, so we're we're not we're not saying something new about malaria. We're saying that actually we have a tool that can detect it um, validly um, over a large time scale and uh, in a in a big population. Lastly, I want to come on to an extension to the concept of verbal autopsy. Verbal autopsy was first conceived as something to get at medical cause of death, as I've been describing, and to fill in the gaps where deaths aren't certified. That's, uh, that's been a, a valuable um, development. But we also have been asking ourselves the question, Lucia's done quite a lot of work with me on this, what else can we do with this within this same domain without a lot of extra effort and without collecting extra data and doing a whole lot of additional activities. And we've come up with a new concept called COMCATS, the Circumstance of Mortality category. And this is meant to be something that we can consider alongside medical cause of death categories but the, the, calculating the CONCATS doesn't change the medical cause of death categories. It's just another way of looking at the same series of, 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 of deaths. So the, the, down this side are the traditional, uh, well, these are quite crude groupings of traditional medical causes, uh, um, just to make it kind of visible and fittable onto a, onto a, onto a graphic. Uh, in reality, the verbal autopsy, there are about 65 different categories, but we've, we've grouped them, they're all here, but we've grouped them together just for convenience. And the COMCATs that we've defined and that we're working with at the moment are these six. So um, circumstances associated with traditional issues, so uh, use of traditional medicine, for example. Circumstances associated with emergencies, so it can be road accidents or you know very acute illness um, uh, you know collapsing with a, with a heart, heart uh, <coughs> failure that kind of thing um, recognition that's about do p did people 
associated with somebody who was ill recognised that there was a, a problem, you know, the, 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 were actions taken or, or not. Resources, you might recognise the problem but you might not have the resources which might be transport or might be what, whatever to, or, or payment for drugs or, or whatever to do anything about it. Health systems, they can be, um, so for, for people who actually get to accessing health systems, they can perform well or less well, depending on the health systems that are involved. Um, and some causes, some deaths are also going to be in circumstances where death is inevitable. So that might be for very old people, might be for people who have an established diagnosis of, of cancer, for example, where there isn't any realistic um, expectation that they will uh, that they will survive and then there's a possible the multiple isn't actually a separate category that's that's um, <coughs> where more than one of these things applies so we model these in actually mathematically exactly the same way as we model the uh, the, the, the the cause the medical causes and you can see here so the the these are the these are the ranks of which of the COMCATs relate to which of the causes. So for HIV and TB, the, 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 the thing that contributes most to most deaths is, is health systems not, not actually managing uh, cases well enough. So, you know, failure of TB treatment or drugs run out or, or whatever. Um, for other kind of infections, it's about the, the top ranked um, item is recognition. People recognizing that they actually have a serious problem that needs, that needs dealing with. Um, for cancer, it can often be resources because you, you, have to, you have a lot of clinic visits and so on, and uh, you know, that, can, that can be difficult. Um, we don't need to go through them all. In injuries, um, obviously, often they occur in emergencies, I mean like car accidents or, 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 or whatever. And so it's not actually reasonable to assume that the health system should have, you know, should have saved somebody's life if they'd been run over. I mean, it's, you know, there isn't, there isn't a window of opportunity necessarily to, to do anything about that. Um, and, 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 and so it goes on. So that's the concept of the, of the, of the, of the, of the COMCATs. And these are quite interesting if you then analyze them in terms of all populations and over time. So what we have in these charts, so this is from 2012 to 2016, each line here is an age group, so under 5s, 5 to 19, 20 to 49 and so on, up to 70 plus years. This is in the same South African uh, population where we were looking at malaria. Um, and I've, uh, you, you won't be able to see those legends up there, so I've, I've put them down here for you, bigger, so that you, so that you can see them. Um, but what, so what we're seeing is the medical causes of death in the yellowy-orange colours and the comcats in the greeny-blue colours. And you can see there are significant changes over time in terms of mortality rates. That's the vertical axis. There's also very different scales for the different age groups, which you would expect. So, for example, the 5 to 19 year age group, there aren't very many deaths. So the scale only goes from 0 to 1. Whereas in the 70 plus uh, category, there are a lot of deaths. So the scale goes from 0 to, to, to 60. So you have to, you have to read all this quite carefully. There's a lot of information kind of embedded in all that. But what you what you can see if we just if we just pick out an an example, um, so if we look at the seventy the seventy plus group, they have a range of medical causes, as you might expect. So some infections, some cancers, cardiovascular, um, some non-communicable disease, uh, n no pregnancy or neonatal, not surprisingly. Um, not very many injuries uh, by, uh, by, by that age, that's more common in some of the younger age groups and some, in, some where you can't tell the cause. 
and if you look at their corresponding comcat, so obviously the, the top level of both of, of these pairs of graphs is the same, the, mortality, the total mortality is the same, whether you're dividing it by medical cause or by circumstance. And here where it's divided by, by, by circumstance, you can see in the over 70 year olds, the biggest single circumstance is inevitability. In other words, in the 70 plus year age group, there are a lot of deaths that nobody can reasonably prevent or avert or, you know, we all know that. There comes a point when old people do die, where everybody has to die sooner or later. We, might, we may, in some cases, be able to postpone those deaths, but, you know, not, 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 not ad infinitum. So it's not surprising that inevitability comes into that that category and you, if, if, you, if you look at these carefully you can see some other examples that you can reason about like that. So this is to, uh, this is particularly aimed at people who are like provincial health managers, you know, both to see what the trends are but also to see what's, what's happening, what's, what, what's changing. Um, and uh, uh, this is relatively new, but I, th I think at least it has some some mileage as the um, uh, as a as a no cost add on to verbal autopsy data. It's using exactly the same interviews. It's processed simultaneously with the med medical cause of death, so it doesn't cost anything to do this. If you're do if you're doing the medical cause of death, you may as well do this as well because there's no, there's no supplementary cost to this as, uh, uh, at all um, and uh, I think it does give you interesting additional information. One of the examples that we often talk about is that if a, if a woman is, 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 is bleeding in uh, delivery, so obstetric, hemorrhage will be the medical cause of death, that's, that's relatively simple. But there's a whole wealth of difference between a woman who is in a remote rural area, doesn't have any transport, doesn't have any communication, can't actually get to a facility to deliver and she stays at home and she bleeds and she dies, compared with another woman who, whose medical cause is, is still obstetric haemorrhage but who has gone to the, uh, who has successfully gone to a facility but not been well looked after in the facility, for, for, for example, and has, has died in the facility after bleeding in the facility. And the, the, those are, in terms of public health, those are two very, very different cases which you can't analyse just by medical cause of death. So that, that's just one example of why, why we think this is an important way forward. Part of the VA data, whether, whether people went to a facility with their sick child or not, whether the child died in a facility or out of a facility, and um, and what the COMCAT were associated with those. So there were 84 deaths, for example, which were not treated and died out of the facility, but 63% of those 84 were emergency circumstances where you know the, the bad things happen. I mean that's the that's the the message of that. Whereas you know there were there were 127 deaths at the other end where that were got treatment were and and were in a facility and died in the facility, and uh, the majority of those were infectious causes. Now I'm not you know you can't say that facilities should be able to prevent every infectious cause death of a child, but maybe that's. Yeah, you know, maybe that's something to think about if you were the, um, the you know, uh, manager of paediatric health services, for, for, for example. Why are there so many children dying from infectious causes? So it's just, it's just another way of dicing and slicing the same kind of outputs to, uh, to, uh, to give a different perspective on it.